In this lecture, we're going to look more at differentiation operations that we can do to vector fields. Let's start with two operations that we've already seen. We saw these in the context of conservative vector fields. So suppose we have a vector field in R2, which has nice differentiable coordinate functions. Then what I typically call the 2D scalar curl of this vector field, where again, that phrase 2D scalar curl is not universal. It's the quantity q sub x minus p sub y. So it's d dx of the second component minus d dy of the first component. I use this notation for that, but it's not universal. The reason why I do this is that it feels kind of like the curl. So what is the actual curl of a vector field? Well, it only makes sense in R3. So suppose f is a vector field in R3, whose component functions are p, q, and r. The curl of f is that calculation we compute by writing down d dx, d dy, d dz, and symbolically crossing that with the vector f. The result is a vector in R3 whose components look like dr dy minus dq dz, dp dz minus dr dx, dq dx minus dp dy. This calculation is set up as a cross product, so it only makes sense in R3. But notice the third component looks like the 2D scalar curl. In fact, if I took a vector field in R2 and I essentially embedded it in R3 by setting its third component to be zero, so this is still a vector field that only depends on x and y, and it just has this default z coordinate of zero. If you compute the curl of that vector field, now that you can do that because it's got three component functions, you would get zero, zero, dq dx minus dp dy. So you can see the connection between these two quantities and why I like to think of this dq dx minus dp dy as like a scalar curl. It's computing a scalar quantity, but it is related to the general curl. It's easiest to look at vector fields in R2 compared to R3. So to understand what the curl is doing, let's focus on the scalar curl. So what does dq dx minus dp dy calculate for a vector field in R2? Well, what it calculates is the tendency of a fluid to spin, spin locally. To illustrate that concept of spin, let's look at these three pictures. In this first vector field, Imagine I drop a particle right here. What would happen one second later? Well, the particle's gonna revolve around counterclockwise. So I know that my particle, which I've tried to put a blue dot right there, so this is my particle. If I let time go by, it's gonna move this way. But now I'm attaching essentially wings to it. So this crisscross shape. What would happen to that shape one second later? Would it stay exactly as it is and just shift towards the y-axis? And the answer is no. It itself is going to spin because the vectors on the outside have a greater magnitude than the vectors on the inside. So we can imagine this X shape kind of spinning so that this vector which was pointing northeast is now pointing more north. Let's play the same game for picture number two. So what would happen to the particle one second later? Well, the particle would move. It would again travel more towards the y-axis, just following the flow of the vector field. But would it be spinning at the same time? And the answer is yes. I didn't draw this very well, but similar to the first picture, we have greater vector magnitude on the outside. So we would expect this X shape to essentially spin counterclockwise. If I take the same vector field but drop a piece of confetti over here, down in the fourth quadrant, then one second later we expect movement to the left. But this time, the spin would be more clockwise. So just looking at the vector field shows us motion, but it also shows a little spin, and that amount of spin we can detect with the scalar curl. If the spin is counterclockwise, like in pictures number one and two, then that scalar curl is positive. In this third example, the scalar curl is negative. 
Now in these three pictures, I gave you vector fields which did cause spin, but not every vector field does. So if you take the vector field one zero, to every point in R2, we attach the vector just one zero, just pointing us one unit in the right. Nobody would spin. Everybody would just translate in the rightward direction with no spinning behavior whatsoever. So that would have a 2D scalar curl of zero. Now the actual curl, of course, is an operation that we do in R3, and the result of taking the curl of a vector field is another vector. So what does that tell us? Well, imagine I go to the center of a little blob of fluid right here and I compute the curl. It's gonna be a vector. And how that vector works is basically if we were to look straight down the vector, so if I pointed it right at my eye, we would observe counterclockwise rotation. That's not a very practical thing to do, but the magnitude of the curl can give you a sense of the magnitude of spinning behavior in R3. If the curl is zero, we wouldn't observe any spinning. And in fact, we have a special name for that. So if you have a vector field whose curl is zero, we say that vector field is irrotational. Okay, now let's look at a new operation called the divergence of a vector field. This is a calculation you can do to vector fields in any dimension. So of course, for us, that's typically going to be in R2 or R3. The divergence of a vector field, similar to the curl, I'm going to write it as an operation where we're going to take that same type of vector that we created to compute the curl. So this is a vector whose entries, if you will, look like ddx, ddy, ddz. Of course, it's not an actual vector. It's a set of operations. We take that vector, and this time we dot it with f. So we can think of that as taking a symbolic dot product of the operations of ddx and ddy with the component functions p and q. We love this because dot product is such a nice computation to do. So this is just dp dx plus dq dy. It's much faster to compute than the curl. Okay, so let's compute the divergence of this vector field in R3. Of course, you can see how we're gonna generalize this. We're gonna have ddx ddy ddz dot pqr. So if we set that up, we're gonna do the symbolic dot product. That's gonna give us dp dx plus dq dy plus dr dz. Now we just go to the first component function p and differentiate this with respect to x. So that's just gonna be negative sine of x. And then we go to the second component function q and differentiate it with respect to y. That's actually just gonna be two, so plus two. Now we go to the third component function, differentiate it with respect to z. We pick up cosine of z plus two z. So you can see this is a lot faster than computing a curl. And keep in mind, it's a scalar quantity, not a vector. Sometimes I see students, because they're so used to working with vectors, they write dp dx comma dq dy comma dr dz. This is a dot product, so at the end, you should have a scalar quantity. We saw that curl measured the tendency of a vector field to spin. Divergence measures the tendency of a vector field to expand. So we think of our vector field as modeling a gas or a fluid, something like that. Would we observe expansion? contraction or compression, or maybe we wouldn't observe either of that behavior. So first, let's just look at these three vector fields and just with our eyes, determine if we would expect, say, this blob of fluid here to expand one second later, contract, or say, stay the same. So here, if these vectors are stretching us outward in every direction, I would expect that blob of fluid to expand. In fact, that's gonna be the case in the entire domain. If you take a blob of fluid in the first quadrant, it's gonna expand kind of up and to the right, but it's still gonna expand. It'll look bigger. What about this vector field in the middle? I think we should do these two blobs one at a time. Start with the one in the third quadrant. Notice that we're moving kind of towards the axis. And as we move left to right, the vector magnitudes get smaller so if I'm just looking at this, I would expect it to get kind of scrunched up. And that is the case. So in the left half of this plane, we should observe contraction. On the flip side, if I look over in the right half of the plane, one second later, I would expect this parcel of fluid to look stretched. Because we're moving up into the right, and as we move up into the right, the vector magnitudes increase, kind of pulling us. So we would expect to see expansion in the right half plane. What about this final picture? 
Well, if I were going to watch this blob of fluid, I probably wouldn't observe any change at all. Seems like it would just rotate and stay the exact same size. And in fact, it might be a little harder to convince yourself of this fact, but if you were to drop this blob and anywhere else in the plane, you would not see expansion or contraction. It's just going to revolve around. So we call this incompressible when it doesn't expand or contract. Okay, let's see if that agrees with the divergence of these vector fields. For the first one, dp dx plus dq dy is just 1 plus 1, that's 2, that's positive, giving us expansion. For number 2, the divergence is going to be 2x plus 0, that's 2x. When x is negative, it's negative, so we see contraction on the left half of the plane. When x is positive, the divergence is positive, and that's where we're getting expansion. For our third vector field, dp dx is 0, as is dq dy. So the divergence of this vector field is 0, and indeed this vector field is incompressible. So if the divergence is 0, we say the vector field is incompressible, neither contracts nor expands. These pictures are in R2, but you can imagine it's the same behavior in R3. So divergence, unlike curl, makes sense equally both in R2 and R3. Okay, now we can step back and look at the differentiation operations that we've seen so far that we've denoted all with the same symbol. The first one we encountered was actually the gradient operation. So if we had a scalar valued function of multiple inputs, the gradient of that function created a vector whose coordinates were the partial derivatives of the function. That makes sense if f is a map from r2 to r, r3 to r, doesn't really matter, but here I wrote it for f is a map from r3 to r. Next, let's take a look at the actual curl. So the curl of a vector field is an operation we do in R3 only. So if we have a vector field f equals p, q, r in R3, the curl of that vector field, we denote with a cross product, it produces a vector in R3 that looks like this. So the curl of a vector field is something you only do in R3, but we do have a little 2D analog if f equals p q, then what I call the 2D scalar curl is dq dx minus dp dy. It's just a scalar, it's not a vector. Both of these quantities, though, detect the tendency of the vector field to spin. And then what we just saw was the divergence of a vector field. This makes sense in any dimension. We wrote it as a dot product. And if we're working in R3, we would say the divergence of f is dp dx plus dq dy plus dr dz. And as we just discussed, that measures the tendency of a vector field to expand or contract. You can combine these operations. So let's say f is a scalar valued function of three variables. So little f is a map from r3 to r. If you compute its gradient, it would be a vector with three coordinates which means that you could then take the curl of that vector. However, if you take the curl of a gradient, you're going to get zero, the zero vector. So the curl of a gradient is zero, so one thing you can say is conservative vector fields in R3 are irrotational. Right, so the gradient of f would generate a conservative vector field. If we're working in R3 and we compute its curl, that would be zero, so conservative vector fields do not spin. If f is a vector field in R3 and we compute its curl, that's going to generate a new vector in R3. We could compute the divergence of that, but again, we're going to get zero. This time it's a scalar zero. So the curl of any vector field is a new vector field which is incompressible. So these are like composing these operations in R3. So if we start with a scalar valued function of three variables, we can compute its curl. We start with the vector field in R3, we can compute its curl, and we can compute the divergence of that. In any dimension, it would make sense to compute the divergence of a gradient. So if f is a map from R5 to R, the gradient of f would be a vector with five entries, but you can compute the divergence of that. Is that zero? 
And the answer is no, not in general. The divergence of a gradient does have its own special name. It's called the Laplacian of F. There are two notations which are typically used. One looks like kind of gradient squared and the other one is like a delta symbol. So both of these mean Laplacian of F. We're not going to use this. I'm just mentioning it because it goes along with statements one and two. In general, this computation is not guaranteed to be zero. There's no reason why that would be true if you were to write it out. But if you do find a function for which it is zero, we say that function is harmonic. So that's a special class of functions. Okay, that's just a little extra piece of information. I hope you enjoyed looking at curl a little bit more and introducing this notion of divergence of a vector field. We're going to use these when we study the fundamental theorems in multivariable calculus. So we're going to look at Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, divergence theorem. Each of those statements is going to be easier to understand if you understand how curl and divergence work. Thank you for your attention.